And again, uh, so that we are putting the core values in front of us as many times and as often as possible. It's not what you say, it's how many times you say it. Uh, Antioch's new core values are uh, empowering individuals to be all they should be, could be, or ought to be. Restoring hope for the broken and the hurting. Developing disciples through love. Serving the community in love. Antioch strives to be the church that triumphs. Mm. Psalms 115, verse 1. Now, not unto us, O Lord. Lord. Not unto not us. Unto us but unto thy name. name. Give, give, give for thy mercy and for thy trust. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. I also want to acknowledge that today is Ash Wednesday. Mm -hmm. Ash Day is a moment in the liturgical calendar. Many denominations take time to acknowledge and refocus themselves towards the cross. We understand that we are 40 days away from the death of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. And Ash Wednesday symbolically represents the turning, um, the focusing, the renewed and repenting from sins, a renewed way of thinking. Many people observe it as Jesus did whenever he was uh, in the wilderness for 40 days, being tempted and individuals fast during this time. But I wanted to lift it up um, and acknowledge that uh, it is now Lenten season and we are now on the road towards the cross. Um, all right, developing a five-star church. Again, for those with us for the first time, we are delving into a book study, um, The Five-Star Church by Pastor Stan Tolan, Toler. Uh, he is a former general superintendent of the Church of the Nazarene. For those that do not know, the Church of the Nazarene is a Protestant denomination that is actually, um, the, the epicenter of it is Bethany, Oklahoma. Uh, most people don't know that, um, but Bethany, Oklahoma, um is where many Nazarites, Nazarene uh faith believers um sojourner to, right? In the, the latter parts of their lives. Uh Bethany, Oklahoma is the epicenter to that. <laughs> it's a very uh, mm. very Nazarene-ish area. Um that is where I played college basketball at Southern Nazarene University and had uh, the the honor really in uh, I guess kind of serendipitous collide with Stan Toller's nephew, Aaron Toller. Aaron Toller was a senior whenever I was a freshman at Southern Nazarene University and and uh, he was nothing but kind to me. And so uh, Aaron and I have many stories, but um, I've met Pastor Stan Toller several times and it was crazy that I never put two to two together until I got to seminary and had to read his book that I had already known who he was and broke bread with him. Um, but this entire book stems around uh, Stan Toller and a, a colleague of his encounter at a hotel mm. and inquiry that came from their experience, a five-star experience, and them asking themselves, is it possible for us to recreate a five-star corporate model in an ecclesiastical or in a church space? Mm. And the book kind of goes through their thought process on how they begin to think about implementing this five-star experience into a church. Um, and it is my hope that with this, um, that we as a church, We'll become more aware of who we are and where we are, the capacity and the potential that God has for us to become a five-star church. And so um, in the many chapters, we'll be focused on uh, a people-focused church. The first two chapters today, uh, we'll do a little review from last week, um, but that's that's where we're rocking uh, today. I want to give a disclaimer, you know, that... This this is a book of suggestions, right? That we are still a Holy Spirit-led church. Um, 
and that if there are recommendations, ideas, and thoughts that don't necessarily align with us, that we won't be just doing what doing it because the book says that we're going to do it. Um, we're also putting the book into conversation with our church in our context. For everything that Pastor Toller was, he was not in the north side of Tulsa, right? He was in a very, very uh, European context, uh, a very, very controlled context and structured context of the Nazarene church, right? Uh, and so we want to take that into consideration. Uh, again, we want to determine what is applicable to Antioch Baptist Church, Tulsa. Uh, we want to stamp and document some key takeaways that you might have. Again, parking lot information that is things that uh, we need to put on hold, things we might not be ready for now, things that might uh, warrant um, conversation beyond um, the Bible study space, right? We want to stamp the things that are not for us, right? This ain't, this isn't for Antioch. We can't do this. We don't have the capacity to. Um, and so we want to name those things as well. All right. So this is how we approaching everything. And if you remember last week, we did focus groups. We broke everybody up into groups and there was five groups. And I asked you all questions in um, six different areas, I believe. Um, and what I did this week uh, and today was to tabulate the responses mm -hmm. um, so that we could look at them together and maybe discuss and hear some feedback from them um, before we kind of get a little bit more into the lesson. Um, but the first thing uh, that we looked at was the communication, how 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 a five-star church communicates. And we asked ourselves, um, how does Antioch communicate his her vision and mission? Um, and uh, what we came out with was uh, a 4.3, right? So this is out of a scale of one to five. Uh, five being very well and one being not so well, all right? So um, from our focus groups, we determined that Antioch does a very good job, right? Above normal, above approach um, in putting the vision in front of us. And really, I, I personally think that we do better than a 4.3 because <laughs> you can't get on the Bible study or have a meeting without us saying the vision. Mm -hmm. uh, of the church that's true that's true uh, and so there, there's a whole lot of things that we do um but one of those things is definitely putting the vision up front so everybody mm -hmm. is aware of it um in this question it asks do we put the vision in front of new members and i think that is what took us down the lowest uh there's a whole lot of threes um in that one and that is simply uh, actually a, a conversation that I had. That's one of the reasons why in my, Bible, in my Bible study PowerPoint slides, I put the vision in written form, where for many of you all, you've had many years to, <laughs> to memorize it. When I first came to Antioch, I did not. And I actually needed Paula to text it to me so I knew what it was, right? Mm -hmm. And so I thought that there might be others um, who are new to this space. And so making sure that we're putting it in front of individuals uh, is important. Okay. Are there any other thoughts around that? Is that surprising to you all? Or you, you think that's good? That, that's probably spot on? But Reverend Gill. Yeah. Could they not uh, have a hard copy of the core values and have a copy of all of this so that they can look at it every day? Yeah, I actually uh in my in my inbox are some um uh, some prints, you know, uh that we can put up in the hallway that has the church vision statement on it and the core value statement on it. Um and so we're looking at getting quotes to getting those printed up as well as like signs to give people direction on where to go and things of that nature. Uh oh. so we're looking to do that. All right. But 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 Pastor Gill, I thought when we did new membership classes that all that was already available to the new members 
And I guess we're not doing uh, new membership anymore, are we not? That I since I've been here, and of course I came post pandemic, um, and right at the the heels of pandemic, and it might have been something that was instituted during, I mean before the pandemic. But since I've been here, I haven't heard of any uh, new members classes taking place. Okay. Somebody can correct me. I'm always open for that. It hasn't been, but it's very important that they started. Yeah. I think so, too. Mm, yes. Okay. And so, uh, all right. And then the next one is a church's willingness to change. The work, church's willingness to change. So it's questions like, uh, is the church open uh, to change? Um, does the church cling to ineffective ministries? Um, mm -hmm. Is the church strapped to tradition? Is the church flexible? And is the church looking more towards the future than the past? And uh, the focus groups collectively gave Antioch a 3.8. Mm -hmm. um, a 3.8. Any uh, comments or reactions to this? No? Okay. All right. How was it? Yes. Go ahead. Yes, it is, because uh, we do cling, I think, to tradition. Um. Uh, because going back to our basics and things like that, it's sort of a question with a lot of people because you have a lot of new people and the people that have been there like 30 years and 40 years and all that. It's just like, it's not, you know, resonating. It's not getting over to them that we have to make this change and we've got to go forward. We still have that cling to the old tradition, which is good, because without that old of tradition, we still can't go forward like we want to go. I I, to, it doesn't make sense. No, it makes. It Does makes, that make sense? Makes, no, it makes perfect sense. I have to uh, next week. I'm blessed with the opportunity to go and preach at. Um, the Sammy DeWitt Proctor Conference in Chicago. It's a, a global conference. It's not just national, it's global. So I'm going to be, y'all pray for me because I'm going to be on a stage with tens of thousands of people looking at me. Uh, okay. Uh, but the, 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 the text that I'm looking at is Genesis chapter 41. Um, the theme for the conference is cherishing the past while looking towards the future, reimagining, reinventing um, what is to come. And one of the things I'm gonna argue in my, in my sermon is that, you know, when Joseph makes the declaration that the God helped him to forget, mm -hmm. that he lost his ability to reimagine a future because he forgot Right. Um, simply put, like in uh, the African Ghanaian word is is Sankofa, right? This this notion that, or it's it's symbolized with the myth, mythical bird that is flying forward with its feet planted backwards and head planted backwards, backwards. and mm -hmm. so looking backwards while moving forward. Right? It's just an African mm -hmm. proverb that I can't move forward unless I'm looking back, and so. The past is inter intricately entwined in being able to reimagine a future. The issue is that sometimes individuals get so focused on the past that they are looking forward but moving backwards. Hmm. Right? So they make the past their hero. Right. And it's and it's a it's a romanticizing of the past because oftentimes whenever we think about the past we don't tell the whole truth, right? Like you know mm -hmm. that's that's mm -hmm. that's why we 
in relationships go back to toxic relationships, right? Because we romanticize mm -hmm. how it really was. <laughs> you know, you're right. Y'all right. yeah, 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 yeah was in college and kept going back and in high school and kept going back to that boy or that world. Mm -hmm. and, and, right. Mm -hmm. and, and you knew they was toxic. But whenever y'all broke up, you were just like, oh, well, I miss him so much. And you just remember, don't yeah. remember all the craziness that's that going on. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, that's, I think some of it is human nature, but um, mm. if you can identify that that is something that you do, that's the first step. That's one of the things that says in the book is that the first step is being able to name and identify, you know what, we, we do hold on to tradition and maybe our grasp of the old doesn't make our hand free to receive the new. Hmm. Hmm. Um, but we we definitely collectively said that this is an area of growth right for us yes. um uh church development um our towards goals was a does does any have written goals right um do we review the progress of those goals does leadership understand those goals are they measurable and are they realistic? Now, uh, you have to put this one in context um, because everybody in the church doesn't have access to what the pastor's board, um, the pastor and staff have, right? And so if you're not in those spaces, you might not know that there was a strategic plan, right? You might not know, but I think that goes back towards transparency and openness, uh, like I've been in churches that are very transparent with their strategic plan and that they make it aware to everybody that everybody knows that there, that we have a strategic plan. These are our goals and they actually build marketing strategies and things of that nature around it. Um, but I also understand it's easier to make a decision in a room with 12 people rather than 200 people. <laughs> So, so, so th this was a 3.6. Uh, are there any responses to this? Thoughts around it? No. All right. Again, we go back to strategic plan. This is just, again, around written goals, and it's about Pastor, the same. Pastor Gill, I have questions. Even though the pastor's board may make the decision uh, or whatever it is, why is why is the decision not shared with the congregation? Hmm. No, yeah, that's a that's a, a good question. It's a question that is above my pay grade, but uh, <laughs> uh but it but it, it is a question. It's it, it it's based off of ideology and philosophy, right? From things that uh, have maybe been taking place in the past. Um, that which I can't speak through to. Um, I can just speak through the experiences that I've had where, um, you know, the strategic plan has been something that was done in those spaces, in meetings and prep, and then brought out. I, I, I can speak to it. Go, Rev. Because there's never a decision, a final decision made in the pastor's board that is not eventually brought to the church. But the pastor's board has not been in the habit of discussing those plans or bringing those plans until they have been worked. Because sometimes you can't let the devil go in front of you. Mm -hmm. That's right. You, you, have to, you have to make sure that it, it's, it's not an easy task to follow God's direction when you're trying to plan for his work. Mm -hmm. There are all kinds of interferences. So the pastor's board has been one that would sit, work, because we used to go away from the church for a whole week mm -hmm. and would work from nine in the morning till nine at night, working on plans for the new coming year. And when those were worked out, then they were presented to the church. So nothing ever is decided in the pastor's board that is not brought before the church. 
and 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 also I appreciate that Rev, um, that perspective. But I also think that there are things that are brought before the church that the church doesn't know is actually the implementation of a strategic plan, right? <laughs> so because you don't have the the framework or language uh, to know that this is a part of a strategic plan. For example, putting the the TVs in the in the sanctuary that was something that took place in that meeting and then became manifest and there are some things that are visible and there's other systemic things that aren't you know uh necessarily uh what am i trying to say visible for the eye to see um like our discussions around the core values right we we eventually presented it but the discussion on how we got to that point uh is not something that everybody was uh, privy to. Um, any other comments? Okay. Uh, member accountability. Ooh, this was our lowest one, I think. Uh, essentially, this was um, do our members understand their spiritual gift and how to use them? Do our members see themselves as ministers or as representatives of the church in Christ? Do our members effectively help people find their place in ministry? Do members, are members empowered and equipped to minister? Uh, and are the members trained uh, to do pastoral care? and the like. So this was our lowest one. Any, any thoughts? You, we want to we wanna stamp that. We want to stamp that this is an area where, is there a reason why members might not feel accountable that you feel comfortable sharing? <laughs> Anyone? I think they feel like that someone will talk about them. You know, they'll say, oh, they think they know this and they think they know that and the education is this and the education is that. All of that comes in, too. You know how we are. <laughs> <laughs> I, I do, I do. Uh, I, I envision a place where everybody feels comfortable enough to, to speak without the fear of uh, recoil or recourse um, mm -hmm. and being reprimanded, I guess, too. Um, so, yeah, uh, th this is an area we could do better at. So it, it's something that's been stamped. Mm -hmm. uh, th uh, this was our other, this is, that was one A and this is, a A B is uh is one A and this is one B <laughs> is a church that effectively meets the needs of people, which this surprised me. I uh and it might be the wording of the questions. Uh, I think one of them is like members as primary caregivers, members know where to turn in time of need. Uh Meaningful relationships are easily developed in the church. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, that, this one was surprising to me because I, I feel like uh, Antioch has always been an outwardly facing community oriented kind of space. Um, but what, what are some of your thoughts? I think we graded it low because of previous activities that the church used to be involved in. Like the women's ministry used to go to the nursing homes and visit with members and the other people there. Uh, we used to go down to the, the day center and feed the homeless, things like that we don't do anymore. Mm. You got to understand. Yeah, that that's good. I and and what you, what I hear you saying too is that it is a 
it's a kind of member opportunity to give back mm -hmm. um, and to do service. And, and in my mind, I guess I'm thinking through an administrative lens, like knowing that we do, I am a promise. And mm -hmm. how big of a support to the community I am a promise is, right? Wow. To be able to provide free childcare. Um, to have kids who call us, parents who call us, our Strengthening Families program, uh, right? Like that it's a beautiful thing, um, but it's also like how we've been meeting needs. But it, it also can expand. So that yeah, are, that's what I'm saying. It's not that we don't, uh, but there are still on other areas that are not captured. Yeah. So I think I think with all of these that I mean uh the communication was the highest one, 4.3. Mm -hmm. But the point of the book is that we're trying to be a five-star church. Right? Mm -hmm. And so everything that's not a five is an area of growth. Mm -hmm. And so in our mm -hmm. focus groups, we all acknowledged that there are areas of growth that Antioch can grow into. Okay. That there are some areas that we should focus on more than others. And my hope is that we can go through this book and take the test again. And maybe some of the areas that we were, you know, unaware of, we will we'll grade higher some of the areas that we didn't have the language for, we might grade lower. Like, man, like, yo, the book was saying that we do, they do this, this, and this. We don't do that. And we mm -hmm. might be, and then we could put the two together and get a clearer view of where we are as a church and begin to create processes, systems, and programs so that we can be able to become a five-star church, right? Mm -hmm. um, you yeah. uh, know, the, the framework is this. There, There's a book, um, I'm messing up because I meant to look this book up. Uh, the book is uh, tells a story of this Matthew chapter five verse forty one uh, uh, parable where Jesus instructs the um, uh, where Jesus in instructs the the listener that if a centurion asked you to carry his bag, which was common practice in a Roman ruled country, a culture, is for you to just be walking down the street and a Roman centurion who was tired from his day of work could literally make a Jewish person or anyone that he, he might ask mm -hmm. to carry his bags. And the law was that you couldn't ask somebody to carry a bag for more than one mile. That was the law. Can you imagine walking one mile out of the way? <laughs> uh, uh, walk, walk, walking one mile out of the way just to uh, carry somebody's bag. That's funny. Uh, uh, it's Peter Rollins. That's who it is. So Peter Rollins' um, book called The Un Unorthodox Gospel, he tells a story of this, and, and he retells it in a way uh, that says, you know, the person that Jesus was talking to actually carried the bag one mile. Then they had an encounter with Jesus, and they carried the bag two miles. And Jesus comes back to the person and says, you've heard it say, carry the bag two miles, but I say carry it three miles. Mm. And the story keeps going, right? The person carries it three miles. And then he comes back to Jesus and says, well, I carried it. And it, and Jesus says, you've heard it said, carry it three miles, but I say carry it four. And the whole point is <laughs> that Jesus <laughs> is asking us to go the extra mile. That whatever, like we might move the needle. The rule and the the ceiling might be one mile. Mm. God is telling us to go two. And then for a while, what'll happen is that you'll normalize two miles. 
And then Jesus says, no, 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 I don't want you to go too. What I want you to normalize is not the ceiling by which you provide for somebody else. I want you to normalize always going the extra mile for somebody else. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I like you. I ain't going there. Mm -hmm. And what is it? What does it mean to go the extra mile for somebody else? How would you want somebody to go the extra mile for you? Now we bring this back into the conversation of Stan Toller in this five star restaurant, right? And in chapter one and two. He's meeting with the general manager of the hotel, asking, how do you, how can we work together to put a framework so that we can bring this five-star model to the church? And in the midst of it, Stan and his partner acknowledge the fact that they're sitting in a room, right, that has all of the amenities that they might need. It doesn't just have uh, the, the normal outlet that's in the wall, right? My mom went through her house and changed all the outlets in her house, but now they have that USB uh, converter thing in there. So you can, you don't need the little block on your, your phone charger. You can just charge the phone right up to the wall. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right, it go go on the extra mile. I I know you like sandwiches, but I didn't know which sandwich you brought. So I got roast beef, I got turkey, I got chicken yeah. sandwiches. You know, you got a choice. Know. Yeah, you got choices. I didn't know what chips mm -hmm. that you wanted, so I bought the whole big fifty box full of chips. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's going it, that that's going the extra mile, right? I know you wanted to be at church today and the bus isn't working. Let me go drop my family off at the church and I'm going to come back around and pick you up. Mm -hmm. I tell yeah. the, I, I've said this in, in, in one of my sermons uh, about my uh, the lesson I learned when I was in seminary. One of the things we used to do whenever we were working for our pastor was we I was my pastor's driver, right? Like anytime he wanted to go somewhere, I just drove him around. Uh, and I remember one time he called me and was like, Eric, I got to go to this funeral in North Carolina. <clears throat> this little old podunk town in North Carolina. We're in Richmond, Virginia, North Carolina. And this little old town was about eight hours away. Hmm. And so I drove my pastor eight hours to get to a funeral that we got to late. We got hmm. to the funeral late. We got there in enough time to do the, you know, the little ministerial walk around where the ministers go and shake the hand of the family. Mm -hmm. And then we got back in the car and left. I said, mm -hmm. we, we drove 16 hours for 15 minutes. And he said, Eric, sometimes people are worth the extra mile. Yes, they are. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. I'm never going to forget that. But what does it look like to create a church culture that is everybody is bought into going the extra mile for the other person? Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. So one of the things that the book brings up is uh, the conversation that they had in this meeting around the tension of calling parishioners or people who go to church customers. And my question to you all is, does that comparison give you pause? If so, why? If not, why? Does calling churchgoers customers give you apprehension? Mm. Mm. I think that it's, um, it sounds commercialized rather than um, it doesn't sound as spiritual to me customer mm. it sounds um, 
I like secular, you know, description, but not a spiritual description. A brother or a sister, I wouldn't have a problem with it at all. That, but customer, I, I don't, you know, I just, yeah, that, that would bother me. Okay. Anybody else? Thank you, Miss Ivy. Mm -hmm. If Antioch is a hospital, then I don't see parishioner as customer. Um, I see parishioner as patient if we are a hospital. Miss mm. mm. uh, Teresa, uh, we uh, actually had this conversation. I'm bringing y'all behind the veil. And one of the things that was brought up was this. Um, and Rev, you, you can chime in too, if you'd like. Um, but we, we talked about if Antioch is a hospital, hmm. are we automatically assuming that the parishioner as a patient is sickly? Like you come in sickly. You come in not well. Um, and then what does it look like for the parishioner to get made well? The hospital makes people well. What happens then when they've been made well? Okay. But is it not possible that the person is already well? Sometimes we go to the doctors for the checkup to make sure mm -hmm. that we are well and that we continue to be well. If we continue to be well, even if we don't continue to be well. But anyway, uh, as a well person, we are better able to go out and reach out to others, whether those others are in the church or not in the church. So I don't see every every trip to the doctor as I'm sick. I mm -hmm. don't see that. Mm -hmm. But but even using that scenario as a hospital, if you go to the doctor and his customer service or his bedside manner or whatever you want to call it is not good, you'll quit going to that doctor. You'll go to one that you prefer mm -hmm. that you like better. So as a church, we have to, I think we do have to treat people, especially new members or new people that come as customers, because if you don't like the customer service, you won't come back. That's true. Well, I don't think we have a kind of customer. Uh, point taken. Well, well, that may not be what it's called, but you would have to act like that. Because no, if you yeah. go to a store or to a restaurant and the service is no good, you won't go back again. No, that's true. That's true. I, I, guess, uh, go ahead, I, I, really. I guess my problem is when I think of customer, I'm thinking of someone who's coming to buy some goods or service. That makes me a customer. I'm coming to buy something. I'm coming to get something mm -hmm. as a customer. The other thing is Everybody who's in the hospital is not sick, true. Mm -hmm. true. Being in the hospitals, or well, let me just say it this way, you got custodians, you got janitors, you got nurses, you got nurses aides, you got people who come and take blood pressure. You got all kinds of helps in the hospital. So mm -hmm. in Antioch is a hospital. Yes, there are sick people in there, but there are also people in there who are helping sick people get well. Mm. Mm -hmm. That's the hospital. That's good. I, and I, I, I agree. But, Go ahead. I, I agree with what he said, but in this hospital, if people aren't helping you get well, Thank then you, you would go somewhere else. Or, or to push to push it too, Tony. Like uh, so <laughs> since I moved to Tulsa, one of the things that I've learned is that. Um, St. Francis 
verse what I've heard called Hillcrest rather than yes. Hill <laughs> <laughs> right? Like, so if you're sick, the place that you would probably want to go if you had a choice is St. Francis rather than Hillcrest. And why is that? Because Hillcrest is a city hospital. Mm -hmm. Okay, and what does that mean? Good customer service. They take more in they, they take more indigent people than than mm -hmm. uh That's right. they, does, they so don't they don't have insurance. Right. Yes. So 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 that's good. Does the type of patient that come in should that deter how the customer service is rendered? Absolutely no. not because it should be free. You know, I and I'm speaking at you know as a you know as a parishioner. Um, you know, our our you know Christ died so that we can have freedom, and if we don't uh, have the freedom to to uh, be who we are, you know, whoever we are, if we don't have the freedom to be who we are, then, and we have to act a certain way or be in a certain status to be in this place or that place, then, you know, we're, we're losing the point. Because mm. we're not making a person what they should be, could be, or ought to be. No, we're not. There are good churches. There are good hospitals. There are bad churches. There are bad hospitals. There are good businesses. There are bad businesses. I was blessed to be in both worlds. I was in corporate America in a leadership position. I'm also I was also in the church in a leadership position. One of the things I had to understand is. You have to make sure that the church is doing what she has been purposed to do, or else you be the bad church. And that's mm -hmm. not God's fault, because God purposed everything for the good of the people that he would send to that church for help, for healing. Mm -hmm. So if the church does not do what she is supposed to do, that's on the church. Hillcrest used to be when I was uh, first year of college. Matter of fact, I didn't get to play sports the second year of college because the summer between the first and second year, I was in a real bad car wreck. Mm -hmm. And when they finally got me to the hospital, Hillcrest set me out in the hall in a wheelchair and I was bleeding from everywhere. Mm -hmm. Not laying on a bed, I was sitting up in a wheelchair. Doctors and nurses kept passing, 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 and nobody would stop. Mm. And finally, daddy just had taken all he could take. So he grabbed a doctor and asked the question, are you going to work on my son? And daddy didn't do it in a very kind way. <laughs> because immediately there were numerous doctors and nurses around me. So Hillcrest had that reputation for not caring about certain people, patients. Mm -hmm. If you have not heard, there is talk today that St. Francis is not the place you want to go. Mm -hmm. That's right. That's being said today. St. Francis is not the place you want to go for any kind of medical whatever. But, but getting back to the point, customer for me is like, I'm coming to purchase something. I'm coming to buy something. I'm a customer. And I know that customer can be extended to some other areas also, but let me just stay here for a minute. So I don't think that's what, I come to church so that I can serve God, that's the utmost. Mm -hmm. So that I can learn of God, so that I can be all that I should be, could be, ought to be. And then I also come so that I can be empowered 
Mm-hmm. Tell publicly all that they should be, could be, ought to be. Because just because I have been saved don't mean I know how to work in helping to save others. Mm-hmm. The church mm-hmm. should teach me that. The church should instill that in me, empower me with that. Mm-hmm. Sometimes I think we, we, we lose the utmost purpose of our being as church, mm-hmm. which for me is simply taking God's world as he has planned it, his purpose as he has planned it, and using whatever strength he pours into us to make sure that not only us, but others get there also. That's mm-hmm. our purpose. Make it for mm-hmm. Rev, to, to your point, I think one of the things that the book uh, points to is, uh, is from the church's perspective. And so the church, where, where if I'm a customer, I'm looking it, I'm coming to it as if I'm buying something or receiving something. But if I'm the church perspective, I'm selling something. I'm trying to provide something, a resource that is needed, right? Customers go to grocery stores, but grocery stores provide resources that are needed. Gas stations provide resources that are needed. And the what we're trying to sell to you that you need as a resource for your immediate life and your eternal life is Jesus Christ. I can agree there. But uh-huh. so so, providing the stuff is not considered the custom. One more time. The person who is selling the, the groceries, providing those uh, goods, he is not considered a customer. Correct. But but if I'm selling it to you, I'm viewing you as a customer. That goes back to what Tony was saying. Like individuals that are coming into the church for the first time, could Antioch view them as customer, as this is an opportunity that the Holy Spirit has divine. If y'all have ever heard me say this, like, because I, I really be, it be tripping me out when I think about all the things that had to take place in order for a group of people to be in the same space at the same time. That car had to not hit you. You had to be well that day, right? Like you actually had to not be out of town over here that whatever reason God allowed our life's journeys to intersect on this one day. And that is a blessing. And it's also an opportunity. If for whatever reason, somebody from the Northgate community comes over to Antioch, it could be because it's hallelujah night or a fall festival and they come in there for the first time. That is an encounter, an opportunity that Antioch has to sell that person a resource that they need in their immediate life and their afterlife. Hmm. And so you do you view that per that at Maybe it's not viewing them as a customer, but viewing it as an opportunity for a consumer, right? Um, I don't know what the language is, but that's one of the things that that he's talking about in in the book. Uh, In in corporate America, this language would have, our discussion tonight would have no problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Viewing Viewing a parishioner as a customer in corporate America, there would be no problem whatsoever. That's right. (laughs) <laughs> are we selling something or are we sharing what God is doing? No. Yeah, yeah. That's it. We, that have to take, we have to take what God has planned for those persons coming in and make sure that our spirit is right with it mm-hmm. and send it to that person just as God intended to send it. We're not really the ones who make the product better. Yeah. The giving of the product, the extending of the product, should be done in spirit and truth. So God looks at the cheerful giver, meaning that there is no attitude, no dysfunction, whatever, surrounding it. It's just giving because it's what we're supposed to do. So when it comes to that new that member, it don't have to be a new member because sometimes a 20-year-old member who come on Sunday morning is just as hurting as the new member. Yeah. A lot of them. We have to make sure that when we they first see us, 
there's a smile. Mm -hmm. There's a grief. Mm -hmm. So, that's so, so in that, a way, we're marketing. In a what? way, we are we are marketing. Uh, yeah. well, marketing. We're marketing the Holy Spirit. Well, you so so it's so, not be Rev, marketed. Yeah. So Rev, to what you and Miss Ivy said, we are uh, are giving, mm -hmm. right? And we're giving of ourselves as models. Uh, for this is what. Uh, a salvific sacrifice of Jesus Christ looks like in my mind. This is what redemption looks like. This is what grace and mercy look like. This is what a witness looks like. And, and we're exemplifying that to people. So we are, to Miss Ivy, what you said, marketing it. And to what Rev said, we're giving it. And I think what the book argues in, in this third chapter is what are, are we giving our best? And so we like the, the concept of the customer and things of that nature, that's cool. But are we, are we giving our best? Right. And, and what is, what does it look like for us? However, we view somebody that's currently in the church that is visiting the church that's in the community surrounding the church, who's a part of, I am a promise who's been in the church because of strengthening families. Um, Oh, my class this week, I'm, I'm teaching my students uh, about uh, pragmatic ministries, right? Uh, and we and we we had a guest lecturer come in and talk about planning funerals and preaching eulogies. And one of the things that the pastor said, uh, the guest lecturer said, was that sometimes people coming to the church during a funeral is their first time encountering a church. Can you imagine that? Mm -hmm. at the very first time that I've encountered the church is at one of my lowest emotional moments. Mm -hmm. At my lowest emotional moment, all of my senses are high. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it, right? I, if I don't see it, for some, some, some people, I might be upside, <laughs> it might be dumb, but what does it look like if, if a church was so in tune into every time she opened her doors, I'm going to give my best mm -hmm. so that people see a witness of what God's mercy and grace look like so that you might want to ask more questions so that you might want to be in community with. Right. I think that's uh, one of the the things that the the author is trying to get at, and we this that was a robust con, uh, discussion. I didn't know it was gonna get that deep. I appreciate everybody's participation, uh, <clears throat> but I, I did want to lift up some statistics. This book was written in 1999, and in 1999, 80 percent of churches were either declining or had plateaued. 80 percent. Now the statistics today look a little bit different because we had the pandemic. Right. And oftentimes uh, when you take something away from people, it makes them yearn for it more. And so actually uh, millennials. Uh, again, I mean, this is a whole nother conversation, maybe a whole nother Bible study we can have about millennials and Gen Z and even the alpha generation. But millennials are like millennials are grown. Right. Millennials <laughs> like I am a millennial. And I'm one of the younger millennials and I got a wife and two kids and have had several jobs, right? Like, so um, millennials aren't young. They're not youth. They're not even young adults anymore, right? They're in that middle stage. So, uh, but millennials actually have the highest attendance rate of any demographic, particularly black millennials. Black millennials, because what ends up happening is that people go to church when they're kids. And then they when they become young adults, many of them kind of stray away from the church or in and out of the church. And then when they have kids, they want their kids to go to church. It's it's a cyclical cycle. So millennials are having kids. So they're coming back to church. But one of the reasons why millennials are comfortable 
with even a stagnant church is because millennials are the generation who remembers coming home when the street lights come on. Mm -hmm. I remember right. I remember my daddy saying, don't come back in this house until I tell you you can come back into the house, which meant I had to figure out how I was going to drink, how I was going to eat. I know what it I know what it is to drink water from the faucet, from from the water hose. Mm -hmm. I know what it is to take a rock and a stick and turn it into an all day activity. Mm -hmm. Like, right. right. Millennials know that, but millennials also know the advent of the metaverse and the computer. And so so when even if a church is stagnant, a church might be able to stay at status quo because it is a point of nostalgia for millennials. But we have to remember that millennials, by and large, are coming to church for their alpha generation kids. How is the church creating space for an alpha generation to participate. My daughter can work my iPhone. My daughter at two and a half can work an iPad. Mm -hmm. How are we creating space for that generation of people? If we're not doing that, the cycle of the alpha generation coming back to this institution will not happen. So while millennials are coming back to church, the statistics show a trend that the church by and large is declining. Remember I told you all a couple of Sundays ago that for the first time in recorded uh, denominational history, that there are more people who identify as nuns than they do as Protestant or Catholic. Mm. Mm. Only 20% of Americans attend church every week. Mm. 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 I want y'all to notice that number that says 57% of Americans seldom or never at church. attend church. Mm -hmm. I can believe that. That church, like I said, attendance is steadily, steadily declining. There has been an uptick since the pandemic, but it's still not where it was in the 1980s, in the 1990s. Okay? A couple of things. I'm not sure we're going to have enough time to get to all of these because I wanted there to be some discussion around them. But the book says that a people-focused church unabashedly is committed to top quality customer service. Yes, it does. Mm -hmm. And my question is, what does top quality customer service look like in the church context? Mm -hmm. So we had a robust conversation around labeling or naming, viewing parishioners as customers. But what does it look like for us to provide a service for them to the highest or top quality? Anybody? How, how many of y'all eat at the Waffle House? Let's do it this way. Y'all eat at the Waffle House? No. <laughs> Mm -hmm. uh, Bubba Clifton, why you, why you don't eat at the Waffle House? They're uh -huh. prejudiced. They are prejudiced. They have okay. always had. They have always had things prejudiced. Prejudiced. They're prejudiced. Yes. Okay. That speaks to how they treat people. Mm -hmm. Right. That speaks to their ideology. Anybody else? Y'all eat at the Waffle House. It's all right. Don't be ashamed. I eat at the Waffle House. I eat at the Waffle House because it tastes good. <laughs> but if I had to choose between getting a meal at the Waffle House or getting a meal at Bull in the Alley, which one are you going to choose? I'm going to choose the Waffle it depends on if you're paying or not. <laughs> That's right. Yep. Yeah. Hey. 
I'm paying. I'm, I'm paying, right? Because Jesus already paid the price. Oh, you know, I'm taking bull in the alley then. You gonna you gonna take bull in the alley every time? Yeah. Why, why is that? Well, I've never been there, but I hear it's pretty good. I've only been one time, and <laughs> only been one time. I go. I go where the best service is. Mm -hmm. Right. And there's smiles. Yeah. So a smile. That's great. Yes. How many times have you entered the church and ran into a smile? A long time. Mm -hmm. and how many times have you entered the church and ran into a frown? Oh, not a time. Has mm -hmm. does does the landscape of the church smile at you when you pull up? To me, it does. Or does it frown at you? <laughs> Do the bathrooms of the church smile at you? All right. Or frown at you? Okay, go ahead. <laughs> you getting into a whole lot of complaints now. No, I'm, listen. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so I, I, I want. I'm, I'm trying to push us there. We won't get better keeping complaints on an island. We have to address them for the masses. We have to understand this is who we are. Everybody needs to know that this is a complaint. Yes. Indeed. And then once we understand it's a complaint and we understand that our goal is to be a five-star church, then we take what is a complaint and turn it into a solution. What is the solution? This is Right. Solution. solution we need I, to fix it. Exactly. So that's the solution is we need to fix it. What is the plan to fix it? So now we starting to get, and then once we have a plan to fix it, what's the plan to maintain it? And once we have a plan to maintain it, what are the quality quality control measures that we put in place to help upgrade it? Yeah, there's some rules. <laughs> Getting everybody to buy into it that this is your house yeah. and you treat it like it's yeah, your own you house and don't go, you know, trashing it. <laughs> some yeah. rules, put some rules though. <laughs> uh, Y'all funny. Listen, let's listen. We 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 had time. Let let us pray. And we'll, we'll we'll finish the rest of this uh, uh, next week. Uh, actually, next week I'll be in, I'll be in uh, Chicago preaching. Uh, but we'll we'll try to figure it out. Maybe I'll send these slides to whomever it might be preaching. I mean, teach it next week. God, thank you and praise you for today. Thank you for this uh, conversation. I pray God that you will open our hearts and our minds to what you are. Um, calling us, showing us the capacity that we have to be. Help us, God, to see that there is greater, that you don't require perfection, but you just require the best of us. Mm -hmm. And help us, God, to be willing to give you our best and all that we do. I mean that prayer, God. I mean that for myself. Help me, God, to be open. Help us, God, to be open to giving our absolute best, to not settle for mediocrity, God. That you are so much greater than the mediocre. You put more in us than just the bottom bar or the middling level. That God, when you created us, you said that you saw a very good thing. Help us, God, mm -hmm. to be that very good thing. Mm -hmm. In your son Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. 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 Jesus. All right, y'all. Y'all have a good week. Good lesson. We got pastor's anniversary this Sunday. Get your African attire ready. Uh, um, ready to go, and we'll, we'll be dripped in our African attire dashiki and, and whatnot on, on sunday so let's get ready to celebrate our pastor um 
and, and Lee on Sunday. But y'all have a great